Our guest today is a candidate for mayor of Chicago. He served as the chief executive officer of the Chicago Public, Public Schools from 1995 to 2001. 23 years ago, you may recall, President Clinton was in there, Pre uh, Vice President Gore, and they were shoveling all kinds of money to Chicago to fix up those schools. Our guest today, at that time, helped transform the nation's third largest school system from what was called, quote, the worst in the country to, quote, a model for the nation. He earned his bachelor's and master's degree from Western Illinois University. In 1999, back when we used to have uh, city club dinners, uh, because we needed some money to get the place rolling uh, 19 years ago, the City Club honored him as our Citizen of the Year. And he's so smart that he brought his son, Paul Vallis. Paul, say hi to everybody who served our country in the military. Thank you for your service. His sister, Mary Ann, give her a round of applause. And his brother, Dean. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Vallis. Paul. Cough drop. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. It's nice to be back here doing a solo again, but then I need another City Club mug because I unpacked my box the other day, and for the life of me, I, I didn't know where that mug was. Um, where's Skinny? Skinny, I, I think Dean did most of the financial heavy lifting. He just does it in my name, so it, it makes it look like I'm contributing with him. But uh, it's always been, uh, it's, it's always great to see him. And Let's give him a round of applause for the work that he's done, too. My wife's not here because she uh, works at TSA. The other, about a month ago, I went through uh, uh, the line, her line, and of course, I, she checked my ID and then she kissed me. And I suddenly turned around, and there were like a hundred people standing behind me. And I looked at them and I said, "Well, if you get in this line, she'll kiss you too." So we went beyond that. So she's not here today. Uh, but uh, I'm not joined by my middle son. Uh, he's a police officer, also a former Marine. Fortunately, we didn't have two Marines in combat. He, of course, is a police officer in San Antonio and just loves the job. Uh, my younger son is not with us. He was involved in so many of my journeys, uh, but uh, he's, he's will be following me on this journey in spirit only. And my older son, uh, Paul, who I'm so immensely proud of because of his service as a combat medic for the 5th Marines in Afghanistan and, of course, coming back and becoming a police officer. Notice there's a pattern here. My wife was a police officer. My boys want to be police officers. They all want me to, to run, but none of them want to get involved in politics at all. So they have the good sense not to do that. I want to thank everybody here today who is not running for mayor. Art, I'm glad you're not running. Tom, I'm glad you're not running. Jay, Scott, if you had run, I'd be down there saying, Hey, you know, can I help you? You know, can I, you know, can I provide you with, you know, can I give you financial advice? Um, um, but uh, uh, I think one of the my big disappointments was Scott not running. I think he would. He's so so equipped uh, to uh, take on the challenges that uh, this city faces. So experienced and uh, constantly demonstrating his willingness to to uh, to uh, to be independent, to be an independent thinker, and to let his actions speak louder than his words. So, you know, some say as a candidate, I'm, uh, I'm too professorial, and I am, I am. You know, somebody referred to me as running for the president of a think tank. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's probably, you know, guilty as charged. But uh, I never felt the need to dubbing down anything to people that I interact with. I've always felt that uh, you need to be straight with people, and if the answers are long, people are looking. Uh, for substantive answers. You know, I spent the last six months talking to everybody, uh, meeting people throughout the city, people offering their advice, even when it has been asked for, but always uh, advice that's been accepted. And, um, and people don't want political speak. They don't want campaign slogans. They know the city's in crisis, and that's why, and that's why I'm, I'm running for mayor. You know, a few things just about my background. I am the grand, and I have to do this because I'm a candidate. I've got, I am the grandson of Greek American immigrants. There are six veterans in my household. There are four police officers. There is one firefighter paramedic uh, uh, that we don't, and we won't hold that against him. 
Uh, there's three teachers. In other words, we're a family that has always recognized the importance of public service and have always been willing to willing to uh, uh, do our duty. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm proud of my family uh, because I am a lifelong public servant. I've never wanted to do anything else from as as from my early years, uh, I always felt that public service was a calling. And, uh, and my public service career, Jake commented on a number of things. I actually got my start working for the great Senate President Phil Rock, and then, of course, having the privilege of working with Don Clark Nets for the better part of a decade, uh, and where I learned so much about non bipartisan politics or nonpartisan politics, or as Rock used to say, you know, there's elections, and then we got to do something in between the elections. And they're not with us now, but they have always, they've, they've left an imprint in my mind in the way I approach things. But I had the privilege of re coming to Chicago to revamp the revenue department during the, to, and to balance the budgets, city budgets in the 1990s when the city was in crisis and to put a, a record number of cops on the street without borrowing, without raising property taxes, without deferring of funding uh, for pension, things like pensions, uh, and of course, taking on the Chicago Public Schools. People forget that when I ran the Chicago Public Schools, we had a billion dollar structural deficit, and the schools were considered among, at least by Bill Bennett, to be among the worst, if not the worst, in the country. When we left six years later, we had a billion dollar cash balance. We had built 78 new schools. We had renovated 350 schools. We had raised teacher salaries 17 percent. We had structurally balanced six budgets. We had left the, the district with a one billion dollar, one billion dollars in cash balances in its collective funds, and we had had 12 bond rating upgrades. That's 12 bond rating upgrades, and you don't get that by underfunding pensions. Pensions were funded at 104 percent. But I did similar work in Philadelphia where I balanced five out of six budgets and almost tripled math scores and double reading scores. And then I was asked to come to Louisiana after Katrina by the Landrieu family and by Governor Blanco to rebuild the school system in New Orleans. And today, today New Orleans is a system of 100% choice. It's a public school system of 100% choice. Where, and for seven consecutive years, beginning with my tenure, the city the school district led the state in improved academic performance. There are no budget crises in New Orleans. There, you will be hard pressed to find a student who attends a failing school in New Orleans. And when I left the city, they, when I left New Orleans, they gave me the key to the city. Now, there's other things I've done in the meantime, spending considerable time in Haiti. I'm still involved in Haiti, as you well know. I overcame my flying to get to Haiti. Great thing about the mayor's race is I don't have to fly. But the bottom line is flying to Haiti or flying 40 times or flying to Chile two dozen times after that earthquake. I went to Haiti after the devastating earthquake that killed more than a quarter million people to go down there and to work to try to develop a, a plan to build a functioning publicly funded school system. I, I actually even flew to the, to the Sudan to talk about education issues. But at the end of the day, I've done these things because this is what I do. People ask me for help and I respond, regardless of what the financial consequences are. You don't get pensions in Haiti. I don't, I'm not getting a pension in New Orleans. I don't think I'm getting a pension in Philadelphia. You certainly don't get a pension for spending time in Chile and elsewhere. But for me, that's never been important. What's been important for me is the public service challenge. The public service challenge. It's about taking on the tough jobs. It's about uh, going to help people in need. And that's always been my approach. That's always been my met mentality. Uh, and I've always committed myself to the job at hand. So uh, I'm running for mayor because I, I, I think, uh, I know Chicago is facing dire financial conditions and is impacting and resonating all aspects of, of, uh, of uh, civic, uh, of life in our communities. I mean, think about it, you know, the, the financial condition in Chicago has actually worsened in the last 10 years. Despite an increase in the stock market of over 300%, the city debt has grown during that period by 250%. The unfunded pension liability is $28, million, $28 billion, which may actually be closer to $70 billion if you don't kind of adjust that projected investment earning thing. In fact, I've decided I could end my speech right now and I'm going to say, well, I'm going to increase projected uh, pension earnings to 10 percent and drop the mic and it's all over. It's all done. But at the end of the day, um, that I mean, we're in a serious financial crisis in the city and and that crisis is not lessening. The city has little financial flexibility 
as all but 7% of its property tax revenues is either dedicated to pensions to, uh, or to, for that matter, long -term, other long-term debt. All of the city's new sales tax revenue has also been dedicated to, bonded debt, to bond debt. Uh, and and, and it, it, in fact, we've locked up most of our remaining revenue streams. One of the reasons I opposed the deficit finance, the uh, pension obligation bond so much was not only because I didn't think it would work, but we will have literally been dedicating and committing and securitizing the remaining flexible revenues we have at our disposal, and that is something that you do not want to do. And then we have more than a third equivalent uh, to our property taxes in TIF money, $660 million in TIF money uh, being diverted with no real accountability, with no real investment in blighted areas or economically hard-pressed areas. You know, it, it, the TIF has become a political tool. In fact, some can argue that it's become like a game show giveaway. And while, all, while that financial crisis has been worsening, we've made very little investment in the areas critical to stabilizing the city and helping it grow and prosper. Public safety, 5% clearance rate. Se on, on shooting, 17%. I'm sorry, it's been reduced now to 15% clearance rate on murders. The police department literally gutted by not filling critical vacancies. Schools, constant, constant and continuous financial crisis, not to mention the, sta not to mention, not to mention the scandals. A district that has lost 70,000 of our students during my six-year tenure, we actually grew. The only time in three decades that the population for the Chicago Public Schools has grown is the six years when I was superintendent. 70,000 more students then than are in the district now. And City College just hasn't escaped that. One-third fewer students in City College. We used to have 1,200 students in the nursing program City College. That's a field in demand. Now we have four, fewer than 400. So the schools, are, and then economic development. N name me the wards, anyone, that are, where you actually see investment. What is it? Five, six, seven, benefit of the doubt, 10? The rest of the wards are either stagnant or in a, a period of serious economic decline. There are areas in the city that are in depression conditions. In the Rosen area, on the south side, you go through Englewood, I've seen more economic activity in Port of Prince Haiti, and I've been there 40 times. The, these areas are economic dead zones, and I'm sorry, but Whole Foods that are subsidized with what? Up to $10 million in TIF money is not economic development. So clearly, clearly this is a city, this is a city in crisis. This is a city in crisis, and we see it. While the nation's population grows each year, Chicago's losing population every year, and we're losing student population in droves. The aggregate property tax revenue, uh, the, the aggregate property, uh, 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 residential property values, got it right, has declined by 17% since the Great Recession, while nationally it's up 8%. Think about that. That means despite the cranes and despite all the construction that you're seeing in certain areas of the city in that three or four mile ra ra radius outside, outside the loop, we have areas that are losing 20, 30, 40% and even more of their residential property tax wealth. If we had just grown at the national level, and we would be generating $600, $700 million more in taxes without having to raise taxes just from the natural revenue growth, just by not losing wealth and value. And then we look at infrastructure. And, you know, let me talk. Have we had an affordable housing program? Have we really had an effort to reduce housing costs or make housing more affordable without massive subsidies? And I'm sorry, we have a lead-in-the-water problem. We have a lead-in-the-water problem, and the facts... Don't change the facts that there's a problem there, and that problem needs to be addressed. Not to mention new job growth at half the na national rate, or the fact that African-American unemployment, that, that African-American unemployment in the city is 16%, while the unemployment of whites is less than 5%. That is not economic growth that you can believe in. That's a city in decline. So my plan, and that's why I'm here for, my plan is to, is to develop and implement a five-year plan that will generate enough revenue and savings to address the city's pension needs and reduce other long-term obligations and invest in the critical areas, uh, the critical areas uh, essential to improving the quality of life so that you're creating conditions in the community uh, conducive to city growth. So we've got to address our pension issues. 
And we have to address our other long-term obligations unrelated to pensions, and we've got to invest in the communities so that the city can grow. Because a, a city that is not growing is a city in decline. So this is how I'm going to do it. And remember, the idea here is to lay out a five-year prescription and these revenue and spending ideas that I'm putting out are things that need to be achieved over a five-year period. Because the pension obligation, and Jay, could I, could I have a napkin for a second? I apologize. I've had a very bad cold and my nose is running, trust me. I apologize for that. That wasn't scripted when I rehearsed this back at the office. But uh, uh, when we look at our pension obligations based on, conserv uh, based on optimistic estimates on what the earnings will generate, we have to ramp up and we have to increase our pension contributions by $1,046,000,000 by 2023. So it is a five-year ramp up. So, and so what we're talking is about laying out a five-year structurally balanced budget plan to address those issues and others. So, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is spending. When you look at the city budget and all the budgets that the city controls, uh, what is it? It's like close to $20 billion. And I believe that the city, that there is no reason why the city can't reduce its expenditures by about $500 million minimum over the, next, over the next five years. Now, I have never met a budget that I haven't been able to either cut or reprioritize anywhere from 5 to 10% of the savings. That's why I closed the structural deficits in, in Chicago and, yes, in Philadelphia. Uh, and that's how, that's how I was able to balance the budgets in New Orleans, even though because because the census data that was used to allocate the new, the, uh, the, the money, the federal bailout money after the 2008 recession, uh, uh, none of the, no money went to New Orleans because we didn't have any students that they based the contribution. So we were the only district that didn't get federal money, federal bailout money, and, and yet three years later, I think we were the only district in the state that wasn't in financial distress. So you figure that one out. But at the end of the day, what I'm talking about doing is I'm, I'm talking about uh, developing a strategy that provides for revenue-based labor contracts. When we would negotiate our labor contracts, they are always tied to available revenues. The tax inc the uh, increases in salaries and compensation were always linked and indexed to available revenues. So the idea was to bring our contracts within our financial constraints. And, and you do this by strategic bargaining constantly and by bringing the unions into the process so they fully understand the budget uh, conditions that you're dealing with. Secondly, we need to create a third tier pension system. Look, I am all for, I wish we could get a constitutional amendment passed so that the Supreme Court wouldn't overturn any legitimate comprehensive pension compromise that was reached. I mean, it's ridiculous that well thought out and well developed compromises have been rejected. But the reality is, Ask Pat Quinn how difficult it is to get resolutions on the budget or to get resol uh, resolutions on the ballot. I mean, at the end of the day, we are constantly ha having efforts uh, um, uh, blocked, uh, even when labor and management have come together. So, uh, so I want to stop punishing the second tier who, by the time they're done, and I'm surprised they're not suing us, are going to actually probably pay more into their pensions than they're going to get back, if you can believe it. That's the new employees that are being hired. But we've got to look at a third tier. We've got to look at those individuals at the back end of the salary scale. One third of city employees earn over $100,000 a year. Average city employee salaries are $93,000, $94,000 a year. County, $62,000. State, $63,000. And I'm not begrudging people a fair wage, but we've got to look at the back end and we've got to look at that top tier and those individuals making those higher salaries, and we've got to ask them to pay more. We've got to control those salaries and those salary increases, but we've also got to require that they make a larger contribution. And that won't impact their benefits, but it will allow them to, to, uh, to carry a greater share of developing the financial solutions or the, uh, uh, contributing to the financial solutions needed to stand to uh, uh, finance our pensions. Procurement reforms, that includes strategic sourcing, ending the pay-to-play culture, uh, uh, ensuring real competition uh, when it comes to contracts, requiring all vendors or anyone who contracts with the city uh, to to present significant cost reductions in exchange for contract extensions. I remember when I was at Chicago Public Schools, I told all the contractors, I'll extend your contracts, but you've got to find me 10% savings, period. 
You find me 10% savings, I'll extend you. For every percentage savings, I'll extend you another year. I mean, you'll be amazed at what people do when you put their feet to the fire. No, we have contracts where we award it to the lowest bidder, but then we string the contracts along. So at the end of the day, they start paying more. You know, when I built my schools in the Chicago Public Schools, there, my, average per, my average per square footage construction was $126 in 1995 and then $126 in 2001 because of the way we contract and the way we bid and the way we bulk purchase our materials. My most expensive high school was Northside College Prep. Two years after I was gone and they dragged the contracts back into the Public Building Commission, they built Westinghouse for $112 million. So at the end of the day, we can do things on the contractual side. There's additional health care reforms and workman's compensation reforms that are needed. And I'm going to be, during the course of the campaign, getting very specific about those issues. The savings in overtime. I mean, we've had overtime budgets that close, uh, approach $300 million. We've got some people making more in overtime than they're making in their base pay. You know, deprivatizing city services were appropriate. You know, CPS is about to privatize the remaining engineering services and outsource them. Who's going to pay into the engineers? Uh, to, who's going to make the engineering pension contribution? I, I think like $280 million. You are. Taxpayers are. So, so you don't realize that while the workforce has declined, the privatized workforce has increased. And guess what? They're not paying in the pensions. They're not living in the city at the end of the day. That has an economic impact. So I believe, realistically, that we can find 5% savings over the next five years in the base, and we can save at minimum $500 million. And I've done it before, so I can do it again. But you've got to let your employees know that, hey, these are the sacrifices. This is the type of support that you need uh, them to provide so that we can solve this problem once and for all. They need to know. They need to know that this is part of a much longer design. And if you do that, and my approach has always been to let people see what the end game is, let people see what tomorrow will look like, bring stability and predictability uh, to, uh, to uh, their jobs and their positions and, and their levels of compensation. People will make sacrifices when they know the journey, when they know what the destination of that journey is. They won't make sacrifices when there is no plan and there is no structure. Then they, in turn, then they close ranks. Then they protect what little they have because they don't know where they're going to end up. Secondly, we need an agenda for Springfield. I've worked in Springfield for 12 years. For 12 years, I cut my eye teeth on politics and on government and on financial. I learned to be a financial manager in Springfield. I remember, six months, your resume counts for six months in Springfield. And then it's who can get me what when I need it. And, you know, one year I made financial recommendations when the state was in budget crisis. The next year, I just, uh, they moved me from education to the Revenue Committee, and the rest is history at the end of the day. So I learned public finance by doing public finance. So what are we talking about? You know, think if we would have brought Quinn an agenda in 2011. Quinn would have signed anything. When, they, when he restored the pension funding, think if we would have had a, an agenda to provide full funding for the Chicago teachers' retirement system. The same education reforms we got in 2017, we could have gotten in 2011. And you know what? Taxpayers would have paid $1.5 billion less. At the end of the day, we need to go down there with an agenda. So here's my legislative agenda. Number one, what, number one. We need to make sure that if the state raises the income tax, they do not screw with the local government distributed fund, like they did twice. Who was lobbying to say, we're supposed to get one twelfth of that money? No, they adjusted the formula so local governments would get nothing. If we had done that this last time, we would be getting $120, $130 million more from the state today. We need to make sure that we get our share, number one. Number two, we've got to end, we've got to end the illegal diversion of corporate personal property replacement taxes. And in this room, probably the only people who know what that is is Martha and Tom Donovan and Art Berman, who I had the privilege of working for, uh, at, at staffing the Elementary and Secondary Education Committee, and who I hope doesn't become a candidate for mayor, even though he has a, main, he has a mean, he still has a mean tennis game. But, but at the end of the day, that diversion is costing us $100 million, $100 million a year. And then third, we've got to continue to get a long-term commitment so that we can get the remaining funding equity in the teacher's retirement system. Now, that 
doesn't have to come overnight. But if we just get a little a year, if we get the state to give us $50 million more a year compounded, by the end of that five-year period, we'll have $250 million more. Incidentally, they are underfunding us to the tune of $500 million a year. So we incrementally build that back. That needs to be a part of agenda. And then fourth, we got to get our casino. We got to get our casino. And if you, and if you need a temporary spot for that casino, you got the old McCormick Place building, the, the old McCormick Place building where you could basically house a casino temporarily. We need to legalize casino gambling and we need to legalize sport betting. And finally, we need to make sure when they legalize cannabis, we don't get short change, that the state doesn't take all the money and we just get like some licensing fees. We need to demand half the money from any tax on that revenue source or we need to oppose it. Now, people will say, well, they haven't gotten this stuff in the past. That's because they don't go to the legislature with an agenda. And we're probably on the verge, probably on the verge of electing a Democratic governor who has already said he's going to raise taxes and legalize cannabis and all those things that I just articulated. And we, we may very well have a veto-proof House and Senate. Well, let me tell you, shame on us if we don't get our legislative caucus to rally around a a, a plan for us to get our fair share so taxpayers don't have to foot the bill. Shame on us. And my rule, my rule when you go to Springfield is, number one, you don't ask for something you don't deserve. Number two, you don't ask for somebody, for something that other people aren't asking for. Because other people are asking for casinos. Other people are asking for cannabis revenues. Other people are asking for other municipalities need a restoration of their corporate personal property replacement tax. Other local governments are in need of a fair share in local government distribution fund because these poor communities just south of us that have been the recipients of so many of the poor people who are being driven out of the city because the city is becoming increasingly unaffordable, well, they don't have any revenue. They don't have any downtown. They are totally dependent on what they get. Their only growth comes when the state gives them more money. So they need to be protected too. So this is a, an agenda that people can rally around. And then third, we need to reform the city's revenue system. Because if we do the first two, if we reasonably cut our spending, number one. Number two, if we have an agenda, a successful agenda, and we tell our caucus, <laughs> like they told the Spartans, you know, you know, either come home with your shield or on it, we make sure that agenda, Paul, you appreciate that, We'll make sure that that agenda becomes a priority. We make sure that that, that, that is a, a agenda becomes a priority agenda. Then taxpayers will be left with really, you know, the, the remaining third, the remaining third of what we need to do to get the city, uh, you, know, uh, to, you know, to get the city fiscally right. And what does that consist of? That consists of, of us capping property taxes at 5% or the rate of inflation, whichever is less just like the school districts are, are capped. That means, that means attacking and aggressively attacking the property tax appeals process so we don't have commercial property being significantly reduced, even to the point where you might want to consider, as the Progressive Caucus has talked about from time to time, some sort of a minimum tax, so that your, your, your tax appeals are on commercial property, on non-residential property, is not significantly, if not eliminating, your tax burden. You know, it also means doing what Boston and other cities are doing, which is called payments in lieu of taxes. Boston has set up a system where they ask, they ask not-for-profits who are generating enormous amounts of income, whether they're hospitals, or universities, or other entities, asking them to make contributions to help defer the costs of public safety, et cetera. And with that, they've done. I think Boston, uh, last year, the year before, generated 50 to $60 million. These are optionals. These are voluntary. You set up a system and use the persuasive power of the mayor and the city council to get that type of support. Given our per capita size, there's no reason why we can generate $100 million or more taking that approach. And then they figure out the tax advantages of making those contributions. And then it's allowing ta the tax increment financing districts that are in existence to kind of run their course. Their time is up, no more extensions at the end of the day. Reap the values of the expanded revenue base. Bring that money back to the budget, not only our budget, but the school district's budget at the end of the day. But what that revenue plan also means is that we stop punishing people by red light cameras, which we need to get rid of, or by punishing fines. Look. Do you realize that if you don't, I had an Uber driver that picked me up the other day, 
and she got, she couldn't pay her vehicle sticker. So by the time she was done because she was unable to pay her sticker and she got ticketed every day, she didn't owe, uh, you know, she didn't owe the cost of the sticker. She owed $1,000. And incidentally, she wanted, when she owed $400, to get into a payment plan. They said, no, we don't award payment plans until you're at $800 million, $800 million, $800 in debt. So now she's in a payment plan. I mean, this poor woman, this is her primary source of income. So we need, we need to stop punishing poor people. We need to stop punishing everybody because everybody's complaining about the, the excessive fines or the excessive ticketing. Uh, I'm not about not paying f uh, fees, but I am about punishing people, punishing people by taking their licenses away or handicapping them because, uh, because of their failure to pay basic fees. And then finally, we need to make sure, we need to find a way, we need to find a way to cap individual property taxes so that individual taxpayers, uh, so that no one's property taxes ever grow, no one's individual property taxes ever grow beyond 5%. You know, unless they transfer their property or they make improvements or they make additions. So what you would bring is you would bring some sanity and predictability and continuity uh, to the process, to the, uh, uh, you know, to, to the financing process. People would know uh, uh, that this is what they could expect over the next five years. And when the city generates new money, it's going to be done in a reasonable way and it's going to be done in a progressive way. But, you know, address and if you... If, you, if we were able to secure the state agenda, if we were able to get the cuts that I've identified, if we were able to, to, to do the modest adjustments on the revenue side that I've articulated, we would generate between $1.7 and $1.8 billion, more than enough to address the pension issue, and hopefully the balance giving us the flexibility to deal with other issues, like the cost of government and the cost of government services and the collective bargaining agreements, which I believe should be tied to available revenue. So this would give us a fighting chance. But more important, we would have a solution that wouldn't continue to punish working people. It wouldn't be, continue, it'd be, it wouldn't be a solution that would punish business. And we could start designing budgets that are investment vehicles. I'll tell you, one of the things that I did when I, when I managed my first budget, and I've been managing multi-billion dollar budgets for 15 years. I balanced 14 out of 15 budgets. And the only district I ever left in deficit was Philadelphia with an $18 million structural deficit on a $2.8 billion budget. I inherited a deficit close to $600 million. So at the end of the day, I know how to balance budgets. I know how to balance budgets. One of the things that we didn't anticipate when we passed our first budget, which was a five-year balanced budget plan, I wouldn't let anybody go home before we had a five-year balanced budget plan. And five of the people who worked for me on that budget eventually became CFOs in their own right. Chuck Burbage runs the pension funds right now. And Ken Gotch, who has been CFO on a number of districts, or Chris Hoagland and others, they all became CFO in their own right. So when we did that, we projected what we would need to do to balance the budget over five years. And we just hoped that there we would stabilize the district. Well, guess what happened over those six years? Because there was stability and continuity and because we reprogrammed the budget so that we could stimulate uh, growth, we could create conditions to make the schools more attractive. All the magnet schools that have been built citywide were, start, were built by me, save Whitney Young. The IB programs, 18 of those IB programs came during our tenure, our approach to magnetize neighborhood schools. Well, what happened was the district grew. And because the district grew, we got a windfall. So weren't we surprised when after six years, our cash balances approached a billion dollars and our, and our debt per Per, uh, per, as a percentage of income, never exceeded 5%. And the rating agencies upgrading us 15 times, and a pension funded and a system that was 104% funded. So this is what it's going to take. This is what it's going to take. It's going to be, it's, it's this type of long-term planning. It's this, type of, it's this type of budget management. It's this type of setting clear and definable goals. It's, it's the transformation of our budget and finances into a vehicle for revitalizing the city by not overtaxing and not overburdening and by investing on, in those areas that stimulate economic development. I, I'm going to give you one example of this because I have done a series of, of uh, uh, I put out a, a series of proposals 
in great detail that are already on my website. So I'm not going to talk to you about what I'm going to do to restore uh, police strength to the 1990s level and how I'm going to give the police the resources and infrastructure they need to not only be effective but to be accountable. And I'll have more to say about schools shortly, but let me talk about economic development for a second. Think about this for a couple things. Let me talk about economic development for a second. We got an opportunity to take advantage of enormous tax incentives, enormous tax incentives in the federal tax bill. Why aren't we taking advantage of them? The opportunity zones literally allow you to, to in effect, shelter your capital gains, and if you're an income, by investing in poor areas, if you earn income on those investments, they're not taxed. So anyway, so the, the market has exploded. Capital, the federal government's trying to figure out a way through rules and regulations to diminish capital gains tax. So basically, you know, it's a choice between you want to pay the, uh, you want to pay Uncle Sam, or you want to give it to charity, or you want to invest in an opportunity zone, and then if you generate income, it's not going to be taxed. There's 8,700 opportunity zones in the country, there's 133 areas designated in Chicago, mostly on the west side and south side. Well, what if we took advantage of those tax incentives? And what if we deferred, what if we borrowed about, about a third of our TIF money over the next three, four, or five years so that we could invest too? Not just give it away, but invest it. Become an equity investor. Imagine if we had in, invested our economic development incentives. If we had told a business that we're going to give $40 million to convert a hotel to a, you know, to a, uh, you know, a, to, to a series of condos, and, and if we were going to give them a big subsidy, or this other developer gets 20 million, what if we had asked for 5% equity? I mean, if we had done this the last 20 years, we'd have a massive equity fund that we could borrow off of, that we could leverage, that we could use for a rainy day, that we could use the income from to do more economic development investments. So what if we took a billion dollars in TIF money and a billion dollars of investor money? That's 20% equity. You could raise $10 billion for the west side and the, and, and the south side. $10 billion. And you could give those communities hope. Without raising, pro without raising taxes, $10 billion. And yes, it's a Trump initiative. <laughs> Me, I don't care if the cat is white or black. Does the cat c catch mice? And I remember Mayor Daley, the first Mayor Daley, going, going to O'Hare Airport to visit Nixon on the eve of his impeachment. <laughs> on the eve of his impeachment, because he always put the city first. We have areas that are in depression-like conditions, communities where there is no hope. Imagine, imagine if we gave them hope. $10 billion gives them hope. And imagine if we then did some other things. When you consider that the combined budgets of everything that City Hall and the mayor have control over, either directly or indirectly, approaches what, 18, 19, $20 billion. Imagine if we adopted a buy Chicago, hire Chicago approach. Imagine if we did the MBEWB I did when I was in Chicago Public Schools, where I pulled all the construction projects out of the Public Building Commission and required that half those contracts be awarded to minority businesses and half those hired be minority and half those hired be city residents. And you know, 58% of that work went to minority workers. I thought we couldn't find enough construction workers. And to get the businesses, I insured them, and I took the insurance away from Near North Insurance and some of the other providers that were charging three or four times the rate. And we built 78 schools in six years at $126 a square foot, and we renovated 350. And we flooded the community, the community, the Chicago community, with $1.8 billion in salaries. What if we did that on a $20 billion budget? What if we prioritized that? What if we did what the CTA did when they told that Chinese firm, we're going to give you that contract, but you're going to have to build cards in the community. You're going to have to assemble. You're going to have to do assemblage in the community. What if we adopted that approach with everything on top of the opportunity zones and then provided the type of incentives that are already there that we were going to offer to Amazon, like the edge tax credits or the workforce opportunity training tax credits that give you $9,600. For anyone you hire that is in this at-risk category that includes ex-offenders after only 120 hours. We have the tools. Do we have the will? It's a question of priorities. I have always prioritized the community. Always have. Because no one has. For me, the priority has been developing those areas while 
protecting and respecting the need to develop and nurture the areas that are under development, I'd like to remove a lot of the obstacles so that, we could, so that we're not taxing people just by delaying the process of their, them getting their projects approved. But these areas of the city have been neglected for decades. Gailey People's Store is still all but vacant. The other, Michigan Avenue, Roseland, where's the theaters? Where's the Walgreens? Where's the Rumblakes? Where's the Woolworths? Where's the J.C. Penney's? Where's the Studi Young's? They're gone. There's nothing. You can't even find fast food places. And you know when there's not fast food places, you know you've really got an economically depressed area. So that's what this is about. But the city is going to need to elect a mayor who has demonstrated the ability, the ability to, to not only articulate a vision, but to, who has the skills to implement that vision. That's what it's about. And it's going to need someone who has a proven track record of doing it. Who's balanced multi-billion dollar budgets? Who's built schools? Who's resurfaced 70% of, uh, of the city streets? Who's done affordable housing? Who's held the line on taxes? And who's done the type of long-term planning that's translated into 13 bond rating upgrades? At the end of the day, the city's going to need someone with the skills to do that. Because this isn't, it's not time for amateur hour. Or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, running for mayor shouldn't be on your bucket list. You know, it should be, uh, we, are, we are in a crisis situation right now, and we need a crisis manager. You know, I didn't go to New Orleans for pay. I think I had to take a 50% cut in pay to go to New Orleans. I went to New Orleans because there was a need. I didn't go to Haiti 40 times to make money. You don't get any pensions in Haiti. And, you know, and after the uh, Inter-American Developmental Bank grant money ran out, I'm still involved in Haiti. I chair Sean Penn's organization in Haiti. That organization took care of 60,000 Haitians for four years, housed them, fed them, provided hospital, uh, uh, delivered 2,000 ba uh, babies, navigated that community through, through the cholera epidemic because when a hurricane hits that island, there's no sewage system. The water gets contaminated. I know because that same water put me in the hospital on two occasions. Once with so many IVs, I remember when the doctor came in the next morning, he was wearing a hazmat outfit. I thought I was going to end up like Gwyneth Paltrow in Contagion. So, uh, so at the end of the day, this is what it's about, and this is why I'm running. And what I'm going to try to do is what I've always done in, during the course of the campaign. First of all, I'm in it to win it. And no matter what poll, I'm neck and neck. And I'm going to raise money. I'm going to raise money. I mean, now I won't get outspent 10 to 1. I might get outspent 2 to 1, but that's a lot easier than getting outspent 10 to 1. But I'm going to do what I've always done, and that is I'm going to tell people what I believe needs to be done to, to get this city back on the road again. People who are doing listening tours haven't been listening. When you've been involved in public, uh, in public, on the periphery of public service for 40 years, and you've got to do a listening tour, you go get, you, you need a hearing aid or something like that because you haven't been listening. You haven't been listening. I want to give people answers. People want answers. People want answers because they're tired of talking. So I want to, I want to thank you all for coming today. Paul, you don't tell mom that I kind of lost it again. But, uh, but to all my friends in the room, thank you so much, Jay. Thank you for the privilege. I'll take any questions you have, okay? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much, Paul. Well, you're certainly you're certainly leading in terms of energy. <laughs> We have a question. Uh, many of the questions that have been asked, you've already you've already touched on, already answered. One that you haven't touched on is from Dwayne Deskins, who's a member. Should the current mayor or the future mayor uh, sign the consent decree? Why or why not? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, the consent decree is a reality. So the bottom line is, we're going to have a consent decree, and we're, you're going to have to operate under it. So yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I don't even. It, it's really we're beyond. 
we're beyond do you sign it or don't you sign it. And, uh, you know, no amount of rhetoric at the federal level is going to significantly alter the consent decree. What I'm going to do is to make sure that the consent decree, a couple of things, that the consent decree doesn't become a cottage industry. Okay, so it becomes like this self-sustaining where, you know, you're spending $10 million administering something uh, that could be administered or could be uh, overseen uh, in, at a more economical cost. And second, uh, I'm going to work to make sure that the consent decree is not intrusive so that it is not unfairly handcuffing the police and impeding their ability uh, to do their work. So that's the approach that I'm going to take. But I will tell you, 80 percent of the stuff in the consent decree very quickly are things that should have been the police are either doing or they should have been doing. Like, the, do we need a consent decree to say we have, should have one sergeant for every 10 officers instead of one for every 30? Do we need a consent decree to say we need training? And I believe we need a new training academy. And I think that training academy should have embedded in it a leadership, a leadership uh, program or a leadership academy like the Command and General Staff College does in the military. So, I mean, so a lot of things in, the, I mean, do we need a consent decree to tell us that our officers should have tasers? I mean, think about it. Three, four years ago, we had 600 tasers and New York had 15,000. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, there's going to be a consent decree. You know, I'm just going to work to make sure that it doesn't become a cottage industry and that the consent decree does not unfairly, unfairly impede, uh, uh, impede police officers' ability to do their jobs. Here's another one on the police. Terry Nugent of T. Nugent Associates. Please describe, dis, discuss your program for developing police officers who live in their precinct. Yeah, well, you know, let me respond that, you know, you're not going to be able to mandate where people live within the city. But, you know, let me tell you what I'm going to do. First of all, uh, I, my first major policy statement was how I was going to rebuild the police department's strength and get them back to 14,200, which would also include putting police officers in each of the schools, uh, because then the schools who already pay for safety and security they could, they could make their regular contribution that they would make for their safety and security officers, and the city would make, uh, make up the difference. Now, if that happened, you would have close to 600, 700 police officers who 100, all right, let's assume summer school, 165 days of the year would be free to be dispatched to areas when the kids are not in school. So you wouldn't have to be paying a $100 million more in overtime dispatching areas or, uh, or upending beat integrity by dragging officers from one community to another and placing them in communities that they weren't known just to establish a presence, you would have officers that you could be dispatched. So it would work, it would be effective. But the way to change, I mean, there's no substitute for training and intensive training. But the way to transform the police department also is by creating a pipeline so that the next generation of police officers can come from the community. And we can do that very easily. I articulated that, too. And, you know, sometimes when I come out with a proposal, I, I get more responses when I post a picture of Gus's uh, new dog than I do sometimes to putting out a policy proposal. So it's kind of a sign of the times. But at the end of the day, what I've said is we have 46 ROTC units and we have seven military academies, five of which I open, uh, or four of which I open. And that means we have 9,000 students in our LTC programs. 90% of those students are minority students, are black or Latino. We, that could become a pipeline for not only future police officers, but future uh, first responders, fire, police, EMT, drone-operated uh, pilots, et cetera, et cetera. And that in itself would be transformational, because now we would be hiring people who grew up in the community from the community to serve the community. And obviously, that's part of my platform on, on, on policing, using those programs and, uh, and to create a pipeline to recruit the next generation of police officers. OK? A couple more here. Um, what changes would you make in the TIF program for transparency and for distribution to the south side and west side? for accountability. Yeah. Well, Bill Bur Burley. Yeah, Bill, I, I think I've already articulated that. What I'd like to do is to take a portion of the TIF money and use it to invest in opportunity zones on the south side and west side. And let me tell you what's different. I'm just not giving people money. I want to invest. I want to be an equity investor. So we'll get a return on that TIF money that hopefully will exceed the investment. Because if we do that, that gives us an incentive, an incentive to attract private investors to the Opportunity Zones. That and all the other 
traditional tax incentives that we have available from opportunity, neighborhood opportunity uh, grant money that's available through the developer fees to property tax abatements to uh, edge tax credits and things like that. So there's those other incentives that can be used. So now we'll, so, so, uh, you know, so earmarking a portion of TIF money to the west side and the south side and investing that money so we can realize a return is, is the prime, it, it, it would be my priority from day one. We've got to give these communities hope. We're not going to grow as a city if we're only getting, getting investment in six, seven, eight, maybe maximum 10 wards. And, and I would make sure that we allow TIFs to run their course. TIFs need to end. You know, you create a TIF, you have the development, you retire the TIF, let the local governments and the taxpayers reap the benefits. One final one. We have a, a, many more questions than we can get to them. Uh, but do you support an appointed school board or do you feel the board should be elected? Uh, you know, I, I've supported a hybrid board. I believe that the board should have uh, both, both appointed members and elected members. I, I want to remind people what it was like when when the mayor didn't have control over the school board. It was very easy for the mayor to ignore the schools. It was very easy for the mayor not to have an education, uh, you know, an education, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a list of education priorities when it, come to, when it went to coming down to Springfield. You know, because you could always say, I don't have responsibility, I don't have control, it's their problem. So I think the mayor needs to have a stake in the game. So I believe in a hybrid board. I believe that there should be civilian representation on the board, and I believe that the mayor should have appointees. And, and, then, and, then, and then, you know, I believe you would, you would have the type of, uh, you would ensure that the board would have both expertise and accountability, because without civilian representation, you have no real accountability. You, ac accountability requires transparency, and I think with uh, elected board members, you, you get both. Okay? Please join me in uh, thanking Paul. Thank you.